What is up, guys, and welcome to the Strength of Body and Mind podcast. My name is Gordon. I'm going to be your host, and this is episode 22. This is a mindset episode. If you are new to the podcast, uh, the format is every Tuesday, every Thursday, we bring you a podcast. The Tuesday podcast is almost always going to be something body, nutrition, weightlifting, exercise, like physical, okay? The Thursday episode is always going to be typically something mindset related, something mental strength, something confidence, something self-worth, inspiration based, okay? It's always going to be getting inside of your head and helping you declutter and helping you stay on track and course correct if necessary and continue to drive to your goals, okay? So this episode will be launching on a Thursday, but it's going to be something that's a cross between what I just described. So it's going to be actually a nutrition-based episode that is tailored almost specifically for the mindset, okay? And you'll know what I mean by the end of it. Okay, so what are we talking about today? Today we're talking about five foods that people typically think are unhealthy but really aren't. Okay, now this might be you, this might be someone you know, it might not, but these are five foods and I guess it's more five food groups or five consumable things that through a lot of media hype and a lot of headlines and a lot of blog posts by people and companies, the there's been this weird sort of taboo based around uh, really no data that, uh, and this taboo is, is, is like focused on the bad health effects that these foods cause and that these foods, um, like drive us to experience. (laughs) And the problem is, like I said, there's not a lot of data behind it and not a lot of the data that there are, that there is, Uh, available to us isn't really accurate. It's not really backed by anything. Okay. So it's just, it's like bland statements like, oh, this test was done and it showed this. Well, who did the test and what were the variables? Okay. So I have an engineering background, so I, I know a lot about testing. And when you say, and I don't mean you, but I mean, when people say things like a test was done and it shows that this happened, well, who did the test? How big was the sample size? What were the variables? What were the controls? Okay. How many sets of data did they capture? And what was the average? Okay. What was the mean? What was the peak? What was the outlier? I want to see all the data. A blanket statement like a test was done and it showed this is not enough information for me to ever really say, oh, okay, well then that's That's got to be truth. That's got to be gospel. No, I need more data than that. And I challenge you to also seek more data, especially when you're researching something that's nutrition-based or health-based and someone says something and it sounds like it's heavily swung in one direction or the other. uh, I would just, I would implore you to take a minute and make sure that all the facts are there, all the data is there, and that it's not just someone's opinion and that they didn't just craft whatever that thing is to try and get you to either buy something or believe something or practice a certain thing a certain way. Uh, you know, just, just do your homework. So anyway, the five foods that we're about to discuss are things that people I have come across in and out of the fitness industry who have very strong opinions that they're bad for you, but they don't really have the data or any sort of actual information to back it up. It's really just their personal belief, and that belief is based off of, again, like I said earlier, a headline, a blog post, or some article that they read somewhere by some borderline credible um, source. So anyway... Before I jump into the five things, the five categories, the five uh, consumable products, if you will, there's a blanket statement that I do need to say, okay? And it's, it's really a conversation that we need to have real quick about moderation, okay? Being thin, being in shape, being fit, all of those things cannot be possible without doing things in moderation, And when I say doing things in moderation, I'm really talking about eating in moderation, okay? Let's just take 
macros out of the conversation for a second. Let's take micronutrients out of the conversation for a second. Let's take supplements out of the conversation, right? The thing that you need to remember at all times, the number one king thing to remember if you were trying to get any physical body goal of any kind, the thing to remember is that calories are king. Okay, your net calories in versus net calories out. The net net is always going to govern everything else. All right, no nutritionist on the planet, no matter how high their price tag is or how many degrees they have or any personal trainer or any fitness expert of any kind is ever going to tell you anything else. Okay, that should be the number one thing you take away from this podcast and every podcast that I put out and every podcast or media or social content that you consume uh, around nutrition and health and fitness and all that. The number one thing you should take away and just hammer it into your brain, if I haven't done it yet by now, is that calories are king. Okay, not the amount of protein you take in, your supplements, your carb, whatever, simple carbs, complex, none of that stuff. Okay. Calories. The more calories you eat, if you eat, if you consume more calories than you burn, okay, on a daily basis. And when I say burn, I mean, that means your maintenance. That's your normal body burning rate. If you consume more calories than that every single day, you will put on weight. Okay. If you consume less calories than that every single day, you will put on, you will lose weight. You will cut weight. That's just the way it is. You have a maintenance value. Forget about working out for a minute. If you consume more than your maintenance value and you're not training like crazy, you're going to put on weight. If you, and it could be good weight, right? I'm not going to get into that right now, but it could be good weight. The weight that you put on could be muscle mass, depending on how hard you're training, all that stuff. I'm not going to get into it. But if you eat less calories than your maintenance value, and your training, you're going to cut weight like crazy. But if you eat less calories than your maintenance value and you're not training, you're still going to lose weight. Okay, that is the punchline here. And the best part about what I just said over the last minute and a half or so is that some nutritionists and some trainers will charge you like $3,000 for a 10-week session basically just to tell you that. Okay, basically just to train you on what I just said. So anyway, calories are king. That's the number one thing to remember. Now, let's jump right into it, okay? If you want to learn more about macros, I did do an episode on that. It's kind of a basics 101 style on macros, and that is in episode seven. So you can go back and listen to that anytime. And uh, like everything else, podcasts are free, so all it takes is your time. It's a good episode to listen to while you're driving to work or going for a walk or whatever. Anyway, let's jump right in. Number one, fatty foods. Okay, fatty foods. This is the number one food that most people I encounter think are unhealthy and bad for you and are going to kill you, but they really aren't. Okay, yes, fatty foods have fat in them. Yes, fat is the highest calorie per gram macronutrient. Great. That doesn't necessarily translate to you becoming fat. Okay, if you eat foods with fat in them, that is not going to mean you get fat. If you eat an avocado, you're not going to get fat. If you eat peanut butter, you're not going to get fat. If you eat steak, you're not going to get fat. In fact, we need fat. Okay, I did an entire episode, uh, episode 15 on body fat. It was about body fat percent, what our body does with fat and all of the pros and all of the cons of having fat. All of the healthy things that fat does in our body to uh, to protect it, okay, to help it, to make it more flexible, to help our temperature regulation, everything. Uh, so go back and listen to that. That's another one. So now, now you have two episodes, all right? A little bit of homework here. Episode seven, episode 15. Go back and listen to those and get uh, some education on macros and body fat. Uh, but anyway, fat does so much for our bodies, all right? And to try and blame Only foods with fat for the reason someone becomes fat or is fat or stays fat is wrong, okay? And I also want to add in this about fat. Fat, to me, when I think about fat, um, you know, in food, 
I think about fat the same way that I think about sugar and the same way, kind of, that I think about carbs. Not directly, but kind of. Um, And that is this. For most people, myself included, 100% transparency here, I need fat in order to stay sane. I need fat in order to keep myself from losing interest in what I'm doing. Okay, if I were to eat, it, uh, if I were to stick to, I guess, a diet that had me at some ridiculously low number of fat, like 20 grams of fat a day or something, now, to me, that's extremely low. If I were to stick to something like that, a day or two would be fine, maybe a week, but once uh, there'd be a definite breaking point into that diet that would not be very far into the diet, like day six, you know, day 11. And it's because my my mental strength is directly tied to what I'm consuming. And everybody's is, in my opinion. I haven't met anybody yet that can just eat like a robot. You know, And what I mean by that is eat literally only what they need to survive and they don't need any satisfaction from food, okay? Human beings, like most creatures, most mammals anyway, um, advanced creatures, they get satisfaction from food. Food doesn't exist just to keep them alive like it does for, say, I don't know, an ant, all right? We get satisfaction out of food. And because we get satisfaction out of food, which, by the way, isn't a defect, it's it's a brain mechanism, all right? It's security and comfort that is provided to us by glands in our bodies that are releasing certain um, chemicals and certain oils and all the things that are secreted as a result of eating and fulfilling certain like safety and security and survival instinctual needs, okay? Uh, when you eat fat, when you consume fat, when you consume sugar, when you consume things like that, our bodies recognize that and much like eating a big meal, our bodies generate a, a like a, almost like a level of satisfaction, right? Satiety, I guess, in some ways, um, but it's more like mental satiety. And fat, again, is one of those things. So when you eat something that is fatty, like a cheese does this for a lot of people, okay? Ice cream does this for a lot of people. And ice cream has a lot of stuff. It's got a lot of sugar and fat, but the fat is a part of it. Um, You know, a fatty piece of meat, like a really, really fatty steak, like something that's really marbled and has a lot of fat in it. You know, something like that provides a lot of mental satisfaction. Now, for me, again, this is something that I need daily. So when my when I'm cutting, you know, and I'm sticking to about 70 grams of fat, um, I will make that up in over the course of the whole day, obviously. But some of the ways I'll do that is through things like eggs, and I'll get there with certain cuts of meat. Um, I don't eat a lot of cheese, but sometimes I'll eat cheese, and you know, a few other things. But I'll I'm not afraid to to eat fat, I guess is what I'm saying. And peanut butter, right? Uh, So, and you know, those are my numbers. Now everybody's numbers are different. And I was able to be very, very successful at cutting. This is cutting, by the way, at 70 grams of fat. Okay, that's a lot of fat. I mean, I think the average, if you go to like the nutrition, uh, the national nutrition Uh, whatever it's called, website and look at it. It's like 50 grams of fat for an adult man. Well, that's extremely general. You know, my lifestyle and my current physical state and my training regimen and everything leads me to a number that worked really well for me of 70 grams of fat. And I'll bet you that your fat consumption allowance is higher than you think. I would almost probably guarantee it. And if you're running uh, using you know, if you're using numbers that are just kind of like run of the mill average numbers, like that 50 grams of fat for an adult male kind of thing, just a general blanket profile, chances are it's not accurate. And if you've never tested and tweaked it, then, you know, actually, I'd I'd almost guarantee it's not accurate. So, you know, again, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this particular uh, food or this particular consumable, but fatty foods are not the enemy. Okay. Keep that in mind. Uh, and that's definitely number one, you know, maybe if they weren't called fat, then people wouldn't have such a bias against them. But anyway, fatty foods are not the problem. Okay. Number two, 
I love this one also. This is a huge one. This is bread slash carbs. Okay, and the reason I have it as a combined thing is because people talk about bread like it's Satan's earth form that's coming for them and is going to kill them. All right, bread is not an enemy. (laughs) All right, much like fat, bread is not a problem. And to a greater extent, carbs are not the problem. Carbs are not the enemy. Carbs aren't the reason you're fat, and carbs aren't the reason that you're slow as shit and that you are addicted to eating ice cream at night, whatever other horseshit story you heard or made up or your friend told you, carbs are not the problem, okay? Now, let's talk real quick about keto, which is becoming ridiculously popular. Keto is a diet based off of having a really, really, really low number of carbs per day in order to stay in a continuous state of ketosis. Uh, I'm not an expert on keto. I've never done it. It's not for me, but It's usually, I guess, something around like 20 grams of carbs or less per day as an adult. And there's other low-carb diets out there as well, but that one is just becoming really, really popular. Um, As far as fitness people that I interact with, like one in five now are, are actively living the keto lifestyle. And that's not what I'm talking about, okay? That's a very specific thing. And so they're not really singling out bread or carbs necessarily. They're typically using keto as a means to feel better and get more energy. And like, I guess, like, almost it's almost like an experimentation. They're using it as a means to try something new to see if it works for them. I haven't met any lifetime like lifelong keto uh, people, keep practicers or practitioners of keto. And, you know, I know of one that's, you know, a friend of a friend and whatever, she enjoys it. But other than that, you know, it's not, and, and, and I'm not very close with that person, but keto is so difficult to keep up. It is so difficult for most people that I almost see it as impractical and I don't see it as sustainable for most people. Okay. Uh, But anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on keto. Carbs and bread. You know, real quick, let's talk about simple and complex carbs. Okay, because this is something that I think if most people, if more people understood, if more people really got this, that the carb thing, the carb discussion would come down, like it would seriously go away or it would just reduce, become reduced by a lot. Uh, And it's the difference between simple and complex carbs. Okay, this is part of the problem, you know, and and so simple carbs, just so everyone's clear, simple carbs are fast digesting. When you consume a simple carb, let's say a piece of white bread, all right, when you consume a simple carb, um, your body is going to try and digest that quickly. So your insulin is going to spike, your body's going to try and digest that as fast as possible. And if your body doesn't need it right then and there, it's going to store it as fat. So it's going to digest it really quickly and store it as fat. Uh, Now, that sounds good in theory, the first part, because it's going to digest it really quickly. Okay, The part that doesn't sound good is that it's going to be stored as fat, right? And, um, you know, if you're training really hard, like let's say you just hit the gym and you you had a, a really, really, really good, hard, heavy workout for like an hour, the best time to eat simple carbs, to consume simple carbs is right after that. So your body's in a anabolic state now. It's making the transition from a catabolic state where you destroyed it at the gym to an anabolic state now where it's rebuilding, it's repairing. You stretched your muscles so much with each one of those lifts, each one of those repetitions, and now your body's in recovery mode, okay? It's trying to repair itself. So it is using all the resources that are in your body. And if you consume simple carbs, right? A fast digesting carbohydrate right after your workout, it's going to break down extremely quickly. Your insulin is going to spike. That's fine. It's going to break down that carbohydrate extremely quickly. It's going to try to store it as fat, but what's going to happen is your body's going to use that right away to try and rebuild. So that's the best time to consume simple carbs. Now, slow digesting carbs 
are a little bit different. Slow digesting carbs don't result as much in fat storage. Uh, if you take down rice or oats or something like that, your your insulin's not going to spike for one because it's a slow digesting carb, and it will break down a little bit slower. It could eventually all be stored as fat if your body's not using it. But the problem is you're breaking it down so slowly that you're kind of using it as it breaks down a little bit, and that is true throughout the day. Uh, even when you're not like like immediately post training, so those are going to be the best carbs to consume in most situations. All right. Uh, so th- I think if most people, if more people understood those two things, the difference between simple and complex carbs, and when to eat which one, that this whole conversation would go away. All right. And uh, just one more quick note on carbs and bread. I want to have the gluten conversation. Now, my wife has celiac disease, like true celiac disease, diagnosed. She had an endoscopy and follow-up routines, the whole nine yards. They looked at the inside of her gut. So she truly has celiac disease. What does that mean? It means if she consumes gluten, her body fucking reacts like crazy. And uh, she has like stomach problems and makes it her whole digestive system just go to shit and that is extremely rare. Now, a lot of people have it. A lot of people truly have celiac disease. Some people have a gluten allergy, but it's like 1% of the population right now. That's what's being declared right now. It's about 1% of the population has celiac disease. Now, that doesn't mean that there's people that have celiac disease that just haven't admitted it or haven't like taken the time to go see a doctor and get confirmed. You know, So maybe the the percent is supposed to be a little bit higher, 2 3%. It's still not a lot. So celiac disease is one thing. Now, because she has celiac disease, my wife and people who have that disease, they cannot consume bread, right? They can't consume wheat. And, you know, that's a problem. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who just simply, not because of an allergy, not because of a disease, simply think that consuming bread is the reason they're fat. No, the reason that these people are fat who are saying this or overweight or unhealthy is because they're, like I said earlier, consuming more calories on a daily basis than they're burning. Remember, net, net is always king. Net calories in, net calories out. Not the amount of bread you're eating, not the amount of fatty foods you're eating. Okay, jumping on to number three, artificial sweeteners. This is my favorite conversation to have. Uh, I I love when I come across people who hate artificial sweeteners and they think that they are pure poison and that they're going to uh, <laughs> like manifest cancerous cells immediately in your body, immediate, like as soon as you ingest them. And anyway, uh, I just I kind of want to put the kibosh on this as much as possible. Um, here's the thing: none of that is confirmed. None of that is true. And there's been now I said this earlier. Studies done, right? <laughs> Except uh, all of these studies that I'm about to talk about are actual studies done by, and they're all recorded, all the data, everything on cancer.gov. You can go there, you can read all about it. And it's the studies done on um, male rats. Okay, those were the specimens used for all of the popular artificial sweeteners going all the way back into the 70s. And the data shows that artificial sweeteners have never been linked to any of the weird tumors that these mice or these rats developed or any of the other um, weird health effects that these encased mice and rats experienced. So let's break them down real quick. Let's start with saccharin a.k.a. sweet and low. So again, in the 70s, the researchers who are part of the cancer and carcinogen group that is now affiliated with cancer.gov, which is a government-funded agency, uh, they they were speculating that they found a link between, this is again speculation, that they found a link between bladder cancer that was developed in male rats and the saccharin that they were injecting into the male rats in extremely ridiculously high dosages. Okay, now when I say extremely ridiculously high dosages, I'm, I really mean it. They were injecting straight saccharin concentrate into rats at the volume that would be equivalent to, say, us humans drinking like a bathtub's worth of 
sweet and low laced water uh, every single day. And they were doing this every day and they were surprised to see that this these lab rats developed bladder cancer. Uh, but they went on to do more research and they have found that the link was actually not at all tied to the amount of saccharin that these rats were being injected with, okay? Uh, so there's two things to take away here. One, human beings do not consume the quantities of artificial sweeteners that are anywhere even remotely close to the amounts used in these experiments, okay? The second thing is, even with those amounts, there was no link between the amount of artificial sweeteners consumed by the rats and the uh, bladder cancer that was developed by the rats. So uh, artificial sweetener number two, aspartame, AKA equal. Okay, in 2005, again, a ridiculously large quantity was used on rats. And again, it was hypothesized that the amount of aspartame used in those rats caused leukemia and lymphoma in the rats. But once again, and then this is all on cancer.gov, you can go read about it, this was disproven. Okay, and the third artificial sweetener I'm going to discuss here today is sucralose, aka Splenda, the yellow packet. In 1998, 1999, around that time frame, this artificial sweetener underwent a similar experiment that is uh, right along the lines of aspartame. Okay, but again, just like aspartame, this came up short on any hypothesis that they had ahead of time coming true about whether or not those rats were indeed getting sick. And all of this resulted in sucralose, aka Splenda, being deemed safe for human consumption, okay, by the FDA. So again, to reiterate, to date, there are no records of anyone getting sick, okay, and there are no uh, direct evidence links between the lab rats that they used in all of these experiments, uh, getting sick with whatever, and the amount of artificial sweeteners that were provided to the rats. So I drink certain beverages and consume certain foods that contain artificial sweeteners. Uh, and I'm sure that you do too. If you truly want to cut out artificial sweeteners, I need you to, Take a really close look at everything that you're consuming from the gum that you might be chewing from time to time to the diet soda that you might be consuming to the other um, calorie-free but sweetened beverage, whatever that may be, and so on and so forth. The, the, you know, it's, it's really kind of found in everything, especially if you try getting into low-calorie foods, right? A lot of times... Brands will cut calories and cut carbs out of foods by reducing the amount of sugar. And instead, they'll throw in a little sucralose or a little acesulfame or a little aspartame or something to sweeten it up a little bit. And you won't know that unless you read the ingredients label. And if you're really passionate about that, you probably will be surprised that a lot of what you eat contains a little bit of artificial sweetener. Now, I don't think anyone is really allergic to it, so it's not really an allergen and they don't need to worry about that. And as a result, they just kind of throw it in everything. And, um, you know, it's just something to be aware of. But the big punchline here is that there is no link between artificial sweeteners and human beings experiencing any health defects as a result of consuming artificial sweeteners. Okay, so jumping on to number four, another one of my favorites to talk about, eggs. Okay, this is definitely a food item that most people who are fat or are for some reason obsessed with nutrition but don't really do anything about it or do a lot of headline reading or read a lot of food blogs have developed this opinion that eggs are bad for you for so many reasons. And unfortunately, it is quite the opposite, okay? Eggs are actually one of the best foods for a lot of reasons, okay? Eggs, I'm going to break it down here in a minute, but if you're into building muscle at all, just, you know, kind of like, this is like a, a punchline that I want to get out of the way real quick. If you're into building muscle, if you're weightlifting or you're trying to build muscle to lean out a little bit, but, you know, build the muscle, but lean out by trimming fat, um, eggs are such a, a, a fast acting catalyst <laughs> to get you there. And they, I mean, there's, there's 
so many ways you can cook with them and, and consume them, but there's so many health benefits to it as well. Uh, let's start with the macros on eggs, okay? For a large egg, you're looking at about 77 calories, five grams of fat, six grams of protein, and zero grams of carbs, okay? There's also, well, by the way, that macro profile, that macro breakdown is fantastic. Like, it doesn't get much better than that, especially for a low-carb item or a zero-carb item. Anyway, they also have nine essential amino acids. I've talked about EAAs before on here. EAAs are something that our bodies don't generate. They don't create it naturally. So you need to consume food that has them or a supplement in order to get them into your body. And there's a lot of foods out there that contain essential aminos or you can take a supplement. But eggs are one that's just packed with them. So if you have a couple of eggs right? You, you kind of scratch that itch for the entire day. So if you're into eating breakfast and eggs are easy for you to, to create, you know, make scrambled eggs, whatever, uh, it's a great way to get not only a, an awesome macro based food into your body, but also the essential aminos. And here I'm going to break down a bunch of other stuff, a bunch of other benefits that also come with eggs. Okay. So, uh, some of the micros that are extremely important that eggs provide are iron, selenium, phosphorus, and a shitload of vitamins. There are a ton of vitamins, high percentages, and a high quantity of different vitamins in eggs. Okay, so yes, you're probably taking a multivitamin. Yes, you're probably eating a lot of leafy greens and all these other vegetables, but eggs have a lot of stuff in them. Okay, and, um, you know, they deliver it quickly. Uh, now, I do talk about a lot of mental strength stuff on this podcast, strength of body and mind. Okay, we, we're very focused on that. And one of the things that as a NASM educated trainer and health obsessed individual and enthusiast, one of the things that I'm... I'm really big on is anything that has anything to do with the central nervous system or neurotransmission. That is extremely important to me. Okay. The central nervous system controls and is responsible for all the communication and all the interaction between all your muscles, ligaments, joints, tendons, everything in your body and the brain power that supports that. Okay, the neurotransmission is the actual communication itself, the actual transmission, the interface between the nervous system and the rest of the kinetic chain, the rest of the kinetic entity that is your body. So I'm obsessed with chemicals and stuff that's in food or chemicals that are created in your body as a result of the metabolites and everything that you're eating and how that all plays together and how that all continues to thrive. Now, eggs, they contain something called choline, okay? And they have about 110 to 115 milligrams per egg. Now that might not mean anything to you, but check this out. This is an extreme, all the stuff I just talked about, neurotransmission and the kinetic chain, central nervous system, all that stuff. Listen, this item, okay, this particular nutrient, choline, is a critical nutrient for the brain. It has three major purposes in the body, and it is considered by anyone who's ever looked at eggs under the microscope, uh, not literally, like, you know, scientifically, I guess, is considered essential for sustaining a complete body of health. Okay, so the three things that I have found that choline provides for us is, number one, structural integrity and signaling roles for all of your cell membranes. What does this actually mean in English? It means cellular communication, okay? All of the synaptic interfacing that takes place in your brain and all of the communication in your brain between your central nervous system and the kinetic body is uh, it's held together strongly and those communication timings are shortened and they have less resistance and less attenuation by uh, increasing the amount of choline that you take in per day. Okay, number two, neurotransmission. Now, I talked about the central nervous system and the neurotransmission that takes place between the CNS, or central nervous system, and the kinetic entity, the kinetic chain that is your physical body. Those neurons in your central nervous system, those are the communication vessels, the communication vehicles that pass messages back and forth. Some of that takes place in a synaptic environment. Some of that does not. And all of that communication that takes place between the CNS and the kinetic chain 
is improved. And again, just like the first thing in structural integrity and signaling rules, the neurotransmission time frame is shortened and it's become it becomes more efficient and less resistance based. Okay, there's less resistance in the chain and there's less attenuation between each, between each signal that's trying to be transmitted and the signal that is trying to be received. Okay, it's very important that those neurotransmitters are firing on all cylinders, okay? And in order to make that like a well-oiled machine, you need to have a lot of brain food, and one of those things is choline, which is found in eggs. Number three, a sor- this is uh, choline, that is, is a source for methyl groups that contribute to, and this is really wordy, by the way, <laughs> that contribute to biosynthesis of various metabolites that substantially improve liver health, okay? Now, Forget about everything I just said there and just imp- just focus on the last couple of words, okay? Improve liver health. Choline, it does a lot in your brain for uh, biosynthesis of a ton of metabolites, and some of those come with the choline because you're eating eggs. Uh, but what it all boils down to and what it all really means is that your, your liver, which is a filter, it improves the filtering efficiency and the filtering capability of your liver, right? But it starts in the brain. Now the liver, there's plenty of things that help the liver in a direct way, meaning I eat this and my liver is going to perform this way. But choline provides something for the brain, which in turn improves the efficiency and functionality and capability of the liver. Okay. So it's not just in your brain that that the choline has improvements. It actually filters out the rest of your body. Just like the first two things I talked about, neurotransmission, structural integrity. Those are things that affect the rest of your body, but it starts with the brain. Guys, this whole podcast is based around one central pillar, which is the strength of body and mind. The mind-body connection is something that we just don't know enough about and we don't study it enough. We're not obsessed with it enough as a race and we need to be. So, I really went off on a tangent here. It all started with eggs. My point is eat eggs because they're amazing. (laughs) They're amazing for the body. Now, the last thing about eggs that you really need to know, everybody needs to know whether you eat them or not is cholesterol. Okay. And this isn't true just for eggs, but since we're talking about them, we're going to get into it. Digested food cholesterol does not have a direct connection with artery, heart, body, etc. Cholesterol. This is a huge misconception. There are people in my life that are overweight that tell me and have told me before and continue to tell me that high cholesterol foods like eggs are contributing to their high cholesterol or are contributing to my heart, my high cholesterol, which by the way, I have fantastic cholesterol numbers. (laughs) They're not high. And, uh, it's it's this there's this belief out there that if you eat foods where the nutrition label says it has cholesterol that's higher than you like that it's going to contribute to high dietary cholesterol and that's just not the truth okay your lifestyle habits in conjunction with high cholesterol foods and other poor dietary decisions that is the reason that your cholesterol is high it's not the eggs that you're eating Okay, if you're training really hard and you have very, very good lifestyle habits and you eat eggs every day and you eat steak every other day, you're not going to have high cholesterol unless it's like a hereditary thing and you have no control over it. All right, but those foods are not going to give you high cholesterol, period. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about, this is an item that a lot of people I know who are not really in the fitness space per se, but they are quote unquote nutrition experts because they choose to be. Uh, you know, they want to give themselves that tag, that label, that title, that's fine. Uh, but they're wrong. Anyway, this last item is one of the things that those people say is bad for you, unnecessary for you. It's over the top. It's, you know, ridiculous. And that is protein supplements. Now, if you're listening to this, then you have a vested interest in nutrition, health, weightlifting, maybe bodybuilding, maybe powerlifting, maybe building a physique, whatever. And so you may have already given some thought to protein and other supplements. But here's the thing with whey protein and other protein supplements like pea protein, uh, plant-based, whatever, soy protein, I guess, if you're into that. It's a supplement. 
It's a supplement. The reason that people, well, I guess the argument that people have given me over the years about why uh, protein supplements are unnecessary and bad is because the argument is that we get enough protein from our daily diet. We don't need extra. And it's like this whole thing like, oh, well, if you're just crushing protein shakes, then you must be a meathead. You know, you must be a juice head. You must be this weird, brainless, like idiotic bodybuilder that knows nothing about nothing and is just obsessed with your biceps, right? Now that shit pisses me off and that's, you know, but whatever. Protein supplements are a supplement, right? If you are going to argue about the word supplement, then you better understand what the word supplement means. It's a supplementary thing. And whey protein is one of those things. Pea protein, soy protein, whatever protein supplement you're interested in taking, remember that it is a supplement. It is something to be taken in addition to a well-balanced diet that is specifically put together for whatever your goal is. And if you take it in addition to, then it helps you hit your macros. It's a low calorie, typically low carb, high protein supplement to have in addition to your meals. Okay. It's not something to just drink as a drink in between or during meals. It's a supplement. Now, the amazing health benefits that come from it cannot be argued, at least not rationally by anyone who has any real data. And those results and those benefits are that it helps you do exactly what I just said. It helps you hit your macro numbers. So one of the problems that a lot of people have is that they'll have an amazing diet and they'll do really well at crushing their carbs and fat and calories, but they'll be 25, 30 grams of protein short of their number at the end of the day. And also, as a result, they might be like 150 calories low or whatever. And the best way to get there is to have a protein shake. Okay? It works so well. And I'm not saying you need to drink protein shakes, but I'm what I'm saying is that they're such a good way to round out your daily diet if you end up in that situation. And a lot of people I know have found that in order to hit their macros the right way, They'll take a protein shake every day and build the rest of their daily diet around that. And I'm one of those people. I have a two scoop shake every single day. And that accounts for, depending on what protein I'm using at the time, anywhere from like 38 to 50 grams of protein right there at a whopping hundred and something calories a scoop, right? So something, you know, around 200 to 250 calories. I'm going to get myself anywhere from 40, 38 to to like 50 grams of protein. It's such a good trade-off. And I build my whole day based off of that. And it's it's awesome. It's such a good way, such an easy way to get yourself to your numbers. And I think if most people saw it that way as a supplement to have in addition to a diet that is well-structured, that they would change their tune on that. So anyway, guys, these are my five foods, my five consumables that a lot of people seem to have a strong opinion on uh, that is they are bad for you. But in reality, they are not bad for you. There's nothing out there that says they're bad for you and has any real data behind it. And if you are one of the people that have always thought that one of these things is bad for you, maybe spend some extra time in addition to listening to this and go and find some more research that backs up my argument and generate your own argument and your own opinion and make your own decision based off of that. Okay. It's my goal to educate people, not just to hear what I'm saying and take it as gospel. Although everything I do say on here is pretty well researched and I don't just try to like pull stuff out of my ass. Take all of that and generate your own opinion and but just use it as a starting point okay but i'm never going to like create an argument and throw it out there for something without having something to back it okay because that's kind of the whole point behind making any nutritional or health decision is basing it off of actual data and actual results not just what someone says somewhere right so anyway Uh, Those are my five foods that people think are unhealthy that actually aren't. Now, if you got any value out of this whatsoever, please share it with a friend. And if you dug it, if you like the content, if it made sense, if it resonated with you at all, 
please jump over to iTunes, leave me a review, leave me a rating. It would mean the absolute world to me. That is how I stay alive. That is how I keep this podcast going. So also connect with me on social, guys. I love talking to people. I would love to talk to you. So hit me up on social. All of those links will be in the show notes. And that is going to do it for this episode, guys. Make sure you subscribe and I will see you in the next one. See ya.